guys, we're in the middle of the pandemic and these are trying times. It's hard on our mental health, our mental state. And this is why I love our sponsor today, BetterHelp. They're the largest online counseling platform worldwide. They change the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, affordable access to licensed therapists. BetterHelp makes professional counseling available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. It's brilliant. Sign up today. Go to betterhelp.com backslash solving healthcare and get 10% off sign up fees. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quedro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost-effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. I think we get formally get started. So welcome everybody to our live cast um, that has been inspired by our kids. You know, I, you know, I'm uh, obviously a, a work in adult medicine and, um, but have been, um, it's been quite apparent that this has been a challenging time for our kids. And uh, I was getting more and more messaging from colleagues, from, uh, even Adrian, I think, messaged uh, Dr. Matheson messaged me uh, saying, like, oh, people are struggling. We need to increase awareness. And you know what? Quadcast Nation, we, we can't, we're coming to deliver. We want you guys to hear from people that are frontline, the people that see it from the ground. Um, sorry, that's my wife shoveling snow. Uh, is that loud, by the way? Is it loud? It's okay, good. It's, good, good. Uh, it's not distracting at all. Love you. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, so yeah, this is why we're here. We, we're here to advocate for the kids and really think about how we can address some of these concerns and, um, and raise their voice. Um, so we got together child psychologists, uh, experts in child maltreatment, social work, uh, principal at a school, infectious disease specialists, just to, to amplify this message. So number one, thank everybody for coming. And actually, I'm going to get everyone to introduce themselves really quick. So first, um, Aaron Anderson, you could introduce yourself on like what you do. And, um, and um, yeah, we'll start with that. Great. I'm Aaron. I am the founder of Revel Academy. We're a small micro school in Ottawa. Um, we have learners age four to hopefully 18 soon. Um, and it is a student-driven school, and so self-paced, mastery-based. Um, but I'm pretty worried about what school school closures have done for not only our students, but but students of Ottawa. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. And you, this is your second time on Quadcast, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Welcome back, uh, Doc Adrian Matheson, whom I've known forever. Do you mind uh, giving a little intro? Uh, we have known each other forever. I think I think the official definition now is forever. Um, so I'm a child I'm a child psychologist. I own a psychology clinic in Ottawa, um, and we service children, teens, parents, and families primarily. Um, and so what I'm looking forward to sharing with you is mostly the perspective of the youth that I'm meeting with every day, um, and also the parents, and then the whole family system and some of the challenges and barriers that we are facing from an intervention perspective because of the context that we're in. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Nisha, uh, do you mind giving a little blurb? Sure. I'm Nisha Danby. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at CHEO, um, and I also do infection prevention and control. Um, I'm really interested to learn from people's experiences here. We talk about, I mean, you know, this, the irony is that the pandemic is related to an infectious disease, but I think we would all agree that the uh, impact that we're seeing in children and youth is the opposite end of it. It's, it's not about the infection itself. It's about the impact of the societal response to the pandemic. And so I really am, keen to learn from the 
experts and um, child health advocates at this table about um, some of the challenges that they've seen and then some strategies to support our kids and youth. Thank you so much for coming, Nisha. All right, Ariel, maybe a little yeah. blurb. Thanks, Quadro. Yeah, I'm a, a school uh, social worker here in Ottawa um, with the public board. I'm here speaking, um, you know, from my experience in working with families, working with students, um, speaking with teachers and administrators, um, certainly not on behalf of my board or on behalf of the department. Um, but in particular, um, what has been really striking to me is just how the inequity um, of, um, you know, how this pandemic has affected uh, different people throughout our city. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And we've worked a lot. I, I should have mentioned in the intro too, like a, a lot of this was driven from our work together, Ariel, with uh, Bridges Over Barriers, which is uh, uh, a charity that we started uh, for essentially to provide basic needs for kids at risk. And uh, we really accelerated that at the beginning of the pandemic because of what we were seeing. Ariel gave us a call saying like, yo, people are struggling. And it really opened my eyes to what the impacts of this pandemic was having on some of our less fortunate. So thank you so much. And then Michelle, who, once again, this is her second Quadcast uh, appearance. And I, 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 I still, I, I don't say this too often, that, that episode, um, was so moving. Uh, it was one of the, actually, I found one of the toughest ones to go through talking about child maltreatment. But um, anyways, Michelle, a little quick intro, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Michelle Ward. I'm a pediatrician and I work primarily with kids involved with the child welfare system and assess kids when somebody has a concern about child maltreatment. So I certainly see the end of the spectrum where things are really not going well at home and somebody has recognized that. But I think the message that I want to bring is that we're all in this and we're all struggling. I myself am a parent of a school age, middle schooler and high schooler. And I can tell you that the discussions among amongst my peer group are not that dissimilar to the discussions that I have with the families that I see. And uh, so I'm really glad to bring sort of both those perspectives uh, to this conversation. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, one other, uh, couple other housekeeping things. Um, for any of the uh, people either in the Zoom meeting, which is much easier, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. The amazing Julia, who's helping out. Thank you, Julia, who's the, um, uh, will be kind of um, uh, assessing the questions and, and uh, which we're going to deal with at the end. We're going to aim for about 45 minutes of discussion and 15 to 30 minutes of questions at the end. Um, so, yes. So, first, I want to start with Adrian. Um, oh. Because I do think you're probably the one that actually pushed me to get this event going. Um, Good. Yeah, no, honestly. Yeah. Um, uh, what are you seeing uh, as a psychologist that raised concern and made you want to increase the awareness of, of, of the impact that the pandemic's having on our kids? Um, so what I, I called you, I think, middle of the day in between clients in, you know, three minutes or less, please help um, in raising awareness for our youth. And that came because as, as psychologists and therapists, we have a whole toolkit available to us that we know works when children are struggling. Um, in this case, and, and when families are struggling. In this case, we don't have tools because children, teens, families, couples, parents are under a, an enormous amount of situational stress. And so typically the intervention for situational stress, you know, as one can imagine, is to remove some of those stressors. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we are not able to do in the context of COVID. Um, so the need is there because other than being able to provide validation, support, um, we're doing lots of work around mindfulness, um, trying to find respite for those where that is a possibility, um, working on self-care when many of those um, venues that parents would use for self-care are no longer available, really trying to just hold the fort. It has been our intervention strategy. And as this has continued on over months and months and months, 
um, people are kind of saying to me, I don't want to do that anymore. They're coming to the end of the rope of being able to hold the fort. Um, you know, I, a classic example is a, a teen, um, you know, I said, it's okay to not be okay. You know, you see this floating around and she says, no, it's not. It's not okay to not be okay. You know, I typically do really well in school and I'm unable to achieve grades that I've worked on, you know, forever in my senior high school years. I can't achieve that and it's impacting, you know, my mental health and my anxiety. So um, we're, we're kind of, I'm, I'm just getting that sense from families and, and from the young people that I see that they're just running out of steam. Um, and our ability to hold is, is becoming less and less because we just don't have that toolkit. Um, so to kind of speak specifically, um, youth are explaining to me that they are feeling, I would say the primary feeling that they are reporting to me is isolation, not surprisingly. We're really fortunate to have access to social media um, and, and the connections that they can make with their friends um, socially through online platforms. But despite that, um, youth are explaining to me that they're feeling really isolated. With that comes lack of motivation that's starting to impact um, their engagement in their schoolwork. Um, and an increase, I would say, in depressive symptoms that we're seeing sort of across the board. My, my sense is that a lot of this is related to the fact that they are being de deprived of their developmental need to connect with one another. So teachers have mobilized to an incredible degree in supporting academic um, curriculum, which is amazing. While they have kids at home and all those barriers, and, and so they're doing what they are able to do. I think though a large portion of what our kids benefit from from school is the academic stuff, but also their need to connect um, with their peers in that way. Uh, so that's that's the sense, that's the overall sense I'm getting from youth. Parents are just, as I said earlier, running on empty, um, limited bandwidth to be able to provide their children with the scaffolding and support that they know that they need. Um, you know, I often will say to my kids, you just need to do that now. And it doesn't work. <laughs> they still don't do it without the appropriate scaffolding and support, but I'm, you know, there's, there's not the bandwidth. Um, that we would necessarily have if we had respite throughout the day um, and more opportunity for self-care to be able to support our children in that way. Um, so we're working with parents a lot around stress, ma stress management um, and trying to fit that in. And then at a system, like a family systems level, uh, what we find is that the cracks that were already there, some of those dynamics that may have already been problematic for families are exaggerated um, and those gaps or those cracks are starting to widen as time goes on. Um, so we're looking forward to, you know, that time when kids get back into school um, so that they can get those needs met and just take the pressure off of them, off of their parents and off of the, the whole system. Mm -hmm. and, and Adrian, do you worry that there's long-term implications, I think, because we always see it, like there was that CBC store that, that, that a few people sent over to me saying like, don't worry, our kids are resilient, like they'll, they'll get through this. And, you know, there's a, a few people that were quite upset about that. But hearing from yourself, like an expert in the field, like, do you worry about long-term implication? Or do you think some of this is, as you said, kids are resilient, and we'll, we'll get through this? Yeah, so I think in the spring, I would have said, uh, everyone, let's just use this as an opportunity to hit pause and and sort of get a get a break from all of the um, treadmill lifestyle that our kids are on. As time has continued, I am becoming more concerned, particularly for our vulnerable populations. Um, we're starting to lose contact with some of those families that we may have been able to have regular contact with who were in routine, I'm sure at the schools, that's the experience as well. Um, so some kids, lots of kids will be resilient through this, but as I think Ariel will speak to, the, the kids that we're most worried about are those that are vulnerable because that gap is widening even further with this extended um, school closure where they're not accessing those important developmental supports academically, but also socially and emotionally that they would receive 
typically. So the longer it goes on, the more concerned I'm becoming. No, I, I, and that's fair. I mean, I think COVID in general has just widened the gap for those that can uh, do okay and those that aren't yeah. or that are having difficulty making ends meet. Um, yeah, that disparity is just increasing. Um, Ariel, this is my nice segue to you in terms of what you're seeing at the ground level uh, as a social worker. Um, what are you seeing? Yeah, so, um, you know, referrals that I'm getting are from schools where um, students have not been able to connect virtually or are connecting, you know, very little um, with their classes. Um, there are families that schools, despite best efforts, and I can't say enough about, you know, school administrators and teachers, teachers and their efforts that they're making, um, but there are families we have not been able to contact. Um, you know, we've left lots of messages, there aren't responses, um, you know, and I think that's a reflection of a number of things. I think so many families are stressed, um, as Adrian talked about, um, you know, and families living in, um, you know, in more crowded circumstances um, tend to be, you know, lower socioeconomic, tends to be higher proportion of BPOC families. Um, and that's just the reality that reflects systemic issues. Um, but those, you know, there are more of those students that were not able to reach them to know what, what struggles they might be having and to try to, to meet those needs. Um, you know, where we can reach students that are struggling. Um, again, you know, uh, teachers, administrators are doing a fantastic job at connecting them with the resources, but some of their needs, we can't, we just simply can't meet because of the current circumstances. Um, you know, so things like uh, an elementary student that I was speaking with this week, um, who is, is finding, you know, in school, she can approach her teachers, she can get the help that she needs, um, online, just the, the sheer setup of it, it's that much harder to, you know, to reach out to a teacher when you need that help. Um, and that much harder for teachers to be able to respond. I mean, they certainly are doing their best. Um, but what's happened is she's become so overwhelmed that she's completely shut down um, in terms of, you know, completing any of her schoolwork, not attending her meets. Um, and I'm really concerned about her emotional and her mental wellness at this point. So, you know, I'm speaking with, with the school administrator and with teachers. And again, everybody's really wanting to come together to support her. Um, you know, the reality is she's living with a, you know, a single parent in a very small um, apartment, um, sharing a room with a younger sibling that has some behavioral challenges. Um, so even for her to find a space that she can sit and do her work is really difficult. Um, mom is certainly doing the very best that she can, but, you know, juggling all of these different demands. Um, so it's, you know, the, the stress is, is tremendous. Wow. And do you feel like cases like that, like, you know, when we look at uh, your normal caseload or, you know, or in terms of uh, kids that are, having a tough time in terms of meeting their education requirements and and, and like have, uh, once again are you seeing this being amplified at this time of year yeah um we are seeing the students that were struggling you know with mental wellness um struggling academically before the pandemic um tend to be struggling that much more so that's my experience the students that i'm working with and so as adrian said the gaps are growing um, so then, you know, upon returning to school, that transition back, being able to make up for those gaps is really a challenge. Um, and, you know, after missing a good chunk of, of school, and if you are one of a few students in your class who is not being able to access the curriculum in the same way, you know, you're that much further behind. Um, and that catch up is going to be really difficult. Wow. And, and I, I do think it bears repeating too, like you're saying too, there's there's some kids where you just don't know what's happening with them. Like they're just lost in terms in the system. Yeah, there are. Um, again, cause we, you know, we've tried every way to be able to reach them and uh, we can't, we just cannot reach everybody. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and some we're leaving messages and we're not getting responses. And again, you know, I think it's the reflection of family stress level. Um, I think, well, I know that there are some students that are needing to look after younger siblings and help them with their schooling. And so they're not able to, to do their own, um, you know, their own pieces. But yeah, there are families that we aren't able to reach. Um, there's, there's also the issue of, uh, of access 
to technology. Um, and, and, you know, the needs are just so great in the city in terms of needs for Chromebooks and needs for internet. Um, you know, I've spoken with families who have run up huge internet bills um, because of having to change some of their, you know, their internet capacity at home um, with multiple children on devices and are, you know, and are really struggling now as a result of that. Um, and just even having enough, you know, Chromebooks and devices um, at home, and, and there are some available to students, but the need has grown, um, and it's grown more, um, you know, after that first two weeks when we were shut down. Um, now there are more needs that are coming to the surface of families saying, you know, we now we really need some tech support, and there just isn't that, um, you know, availability given the number of students that are needing that. Yeah, and, and to put it further into context too, like remember, a lot of these people on the that are barely making ends meet, they could have lost their job. They could be there. They were already going check to check, and now you have increased needs to to try and match. You know their, uh, you know, increase your like you said your uh, internet capacity. Maybe needing more um, tech. You know, like that's real. And um, you know, once again, we're widening that gap between the haves and the haves not. Um, just, can I jump in there yeah, just yeah, for one in, second? Because yeah, the in. other piece to that is is shift work, right? So we have lots of families where they are unable to be home to support, um, you know, an, an, a school day, even with the tech and all of these other things, because they work in places where they have to be present. Um, and so that leads to massive barriers with childcare, um, and again, that child's accessibility to the academic curriculum that's being offered through the schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, let, I mean, let's all be honest here. We're all we're all in the haves category on this panel, and this ain't easy. <laughs> like, it, I, I'm looking at my wife. I'm like, are we staying married this week? <laughs> Because this is killing me. I'm trying to get this done. We can't get this done. This kid's throwing his 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 uh, device because he's getting frustrated. Like, and this. Uh, anyways, sorry, I didn't mean to digress there. But um, Michelle, I first of all, um, you know, I, I made reference to your episode being so touching, and and honestly, I it was one of those things that um, I I personally felt. A need to do something about it when we read in the pandemic in the first wave how you know the stats on child abuse cases seem to be going down and when that's further explained because there's no one to report them you know the the, the teachers aren't able to report them the coaches aren't able to report them and um, I just think this was a message that unfortunately is not being uh not being heard amongst some of the consequences of lockdown. So I just w wanted to maybe hear from you, your, your concerns or perspective from uh, school closure. Yeah, well, I echo what everybody else has said. Uh, and in particular, what you just said, that this is hard for us. Um, and we have all the advantages to be able to do as well as possible. So I think, um, this issue of equity is, is really important. And unfortunately, the child welfare system, um, the people that tend to come to attention are those who are already struggling with difficulties and now this on top of it, which is not to say that child maltreatment only exists in those populations because we know that it's across all educational groups, all geographic groups, all cultural groups, but the, the people that tend to come to attention um, tend to be those who are already struggling maybe with poverty or mental health issues in their home or addictions. And so the pandemic has been, um, um, I hate to use this word, but interesting in terms of it, like to look at it, what has happened in terms of numbers. Um, and what we have seen is actually a real drop in uh, cases of child abuse that are coming to attention. So our numbers at the hospital are significantly lower than they had been in particular for school age children. No surprise because the most, uh, most of those reports come from teachers. Um, so we're uh, actually trying to learn more by, by doing some research on this topic, but I don't think it would come as any surprise to say that it's pretty hard to uh, have time to connect with youth virtually in a class 
setting uh, who might need to talk about something that's sensitive. It's just not happening. So those teachers who are those trusted individuals, a lot of the time that kids can turn to, um, they just don't have those opportunities. On the other hand, um, our numbers in other areas are going up. So while we're seeing very few school age kids, we've actually seen a doubling in the number of uh, very young children. So children under the age of one with serious injuries like fractures and head injuries. So our numbers are double what they were um, this fall as compared to last fall. So to me, that says that, uh, as we've already heard from Adrian, you know, that people are at the end of their rope, they're not coping. And unfortunately, these are the kinds of things that happen when, when people aren't coping. Again, I think it's not really a surprise, right? We always talk about it takes a village to raise a child, and we've essentially taken away the village. So um, we are seeing this, uh, I guess, if there's a positive note on that, I do see lots of people trying to reach out and trying to offer supports in the ways that they can. Uh, it's just that there are so many barriers to doing that right now. Mm. I, 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 well, thank you for bringing attention to this. Um, and it's, I mean, the daddy in me that when I hear this, I just, some inside me, it says like we, it, once again, it needs to be heard. It needs to be amplified. When we have, when we take actions on, um, you know, luck, whether it's school closures or what have you, we always have to look at what are the impacts? What is the secondary implications? And this one can, and I mean, amongst all the things we've said, it just can't be ignored as far as I'm concerned. And um, I don't know why I get really, well, I know why I get emotional think about this because, you know, and I hear one-year-olds, um, like it's, it's, it's too far. Um, but um, what I was going to say, Michelle, what I, what I really enjoyed from our episode too, and I think it bears repeating is what we all can do about it, whether we're in a pandemic or not, like maybe just uh, a quick word on what we can um, do to try and offset those, um, to, to try and bring more awareness to it. Oh, well, um, thanks for that. I think what we talked about before, and it actually ties into what Adrian said about resilience. So resilience is not just something that's built in a vacuum. It's built on a at least one stable, long-term, positive, encouraging relationship. Um, it, the good thing is that just one can be enough sometimes. So uh, the message that I had given on that podcast was be the one person. Whenever I talk to people who have experienced uh, hardship, like, like abuse or neglect in their childhood, and have something positive to say out of that experience and have um, you know, done really well and been successful. They always tell me the story of a person who listened to them, who believed in them, who helped them at the right time. And so I think, um, you know, even in a virtual village, we can do that. We can each be the one person. Um, if there, if we know that there's somebody who's struggling, uh, if there's a way to reach out, taking that extra moment um, and seeing if there's some way that you can connect. That might also be a parent because the parent doesn't, isn't resilient in a vacuum either. And the kids can't do well unless their parents are doing well. So reaching out can be to a parent and that by implication will help the child as well. Absolutely. Creating that connection. We did a, a little um, show yesterday with, uh, with uh, Michelle Sorensen and we, we talked about even whether it's parents, whether it's our little ones, reaching out to you know, old friends right now, try and recreate some of those connections. Cause uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people, like if you're feeling it, realize that a lot, a lot of the people are, are, are struggling too. So um, it's a real way of creating that uh, resiliency, having that uh, feeling that connection amongst your uh, friends and family. Um, so thanks for that, Michelle. Um, Aaron, um, I think this would be a good time for us to hear from you your the your um perspective on the school closures its impact on you know yourself your your uh teachers what you're seeing from uh, you're probably still in contact with some of your students i would imagine so yeah, how's things been for, from your from your perspective yeah well when michelle was talking about how you know schools are like our village right and i really see schools as a hub 
and um, a second family. And when a student walks in the door and I can look them in the eyes within like, you know, two seconds, I already know how their morning has gone, if they were fighting with mom and dad on the way in, if they got a good night's sleep or not, like that's like our, our checkpoint. And instead we're on Zoom, half of the kids, week one actually, they were pretty good. Well, depending on the age, our elementary all had their screens on and they're showing off their spirit wear. Middle school, maybe a third had their videos on. And as the weeks have progressed through January, we're losing more and more and more of them to the little black box with their name in it. And as an educator, it's scary for me because I can't have that eye contact. I can't tell, are they engaged? Are they hearing what I'm saying? Are they understanding what we're talking about? Are they okay? Um, especially with my middle school students and, and, you know, friends, family, you know, uh, the preteens and teens that have already been suffering from mental health issues. We are just seeing it impact them even more, impact their families even more. And, you know, as educators, if I can't see them, I can't have that check-in. It's really hard to have a conversation with the little black box. Um, I have seen again from week one till, till now this week, the apathy's increased, the, the lethargy, like they are so lethargic this week compared to three weeks ago, what coming back from Christmas break, they were all re rested and relaxed. Um, we have put in body breaks, like as much as possible into our school schedule, you know, with dance and boxing and, and all of these different things just to get them moving because they're just, again, they're isolated, they're at home, they know they're not going anywhere. And it's just easier to stay in their pajamas, get in the cozy little blanket and, and look at a screen all day and mm. it's not healthy for them. Um, and so we're trying to get them off the screens as much as possible. But again, it's th that's how they're going to socialize right now. Right. Mm. That's they need their social media outlet. They need to have that chat time. Um, but again, it's, it's just screens all day. So I worry about what we're going to see once all of this is, is over. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, do you get a sense too? just, I know it's, I don't want, I'm not saying you're speaking for everybody, but how about, how about the experience for the, the, the teachers, you know, yeah. um, as, as the weeks have gone on? Yeah, well, I know our, so our guides, um, man, they work hard. They work yeah. really hard. And, and, they, but they find this, even if they're not necessarily on their Zoom all day, they're prepping for the next step and they're having to come up with five different scenarios of how it's going to go. So if we're going to be in school on Monday, if we're not going to be in school on Monday, if only a third of them got this done, how am I going to, you know, scaffold it into this next step? Um, it is so much harder. We're having to, you know, we have mentor meetings constantly throughout the day, trying to have those one-on-one -on -one check in so we can check in on them. But again, it's just, it's a brutal grind right mm -hmm. now. It's so much easier to have them together and have those like little quick chats than, than what they're going through right now. I'd say if we keep this up, I understand why teachers are burning out completely. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. sustainable. Yeah, I, I actually really feel, I've, I mean, I've given it um, and not enough accolades, I think, but a quick shout out to the, all the teachers out there like, the beginning, of, especially the beginning of the pandemic or the um, in September, like I know how fearful and how scary that must have been uh, to, you know, knowing that, I mean, it was an unknown to see what it was going to be like to to go in with kids and, 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 and with COVID uh, being out in the community. Um, but now you're asked to, you know, go virtually uh, in a very short period of time, be interactive, stay like authentic in yourselves and, and engage the kids. Like, I, I gotta say, man, you know, we, a lot of us uh, frontline staff got a lot of love early in the pandemic, but I think there's a lot of love needs to be shared to our teachers, man. Like you're, you're doing our best to keep our, our kids' futures bright. So uh, much love. Um, so Nisha, I, thanks first of all for coming. I, Actually, my first question for you, because I think, you know, um, yes, you're an infectious pediatric infectious disease specialist, but you're also a mom and you're tackling so much. You're, you're active on social media. 
you know, doing uh, some uh, local media stuff as well. How are you doing? How are you, how are you keeping? How are you finding all this, first of all? Okay, so I interpret your question as being, how are you coping with today? Because <laughs> that's, that's where I land on a succinct answer. And today is okay. But there are, there are days where it is not okay. And that, and I have to say, I found great comfort from the, uh, from a, from a message that Ottawa Public Health put out, say, like uh, maybe a week or two ago, saying, you know, for what it's worth, um, perfect has been cancelled indefinitely. Mm. And, um, you know, I think just hearing that somehow helped me feel better about not being able to do everything in my sphere and in my domains because they were suddenly all in the same space and it was hard for me to separate things out Mm -hmm. but um but I think you know it's I think it's a it's a you know I'm, I'm mindful of the privilege that I have to be working in the context of a pandemic where I I get the infection transmission I I appreciate the literature and um, and I, you know, there are some aspects of this, of this virus that are familiar. There's some aspects of it that are truly novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, it's, it bears a responsibility to share that information with people, whether it's my younger kids or my colleagues or my friends who are asking about it. Um, because I do think that knowledge is power. And one of the things that has been really disempowering I have found in the course of this pandemic is is people feeling disengaged from the uh, decision making process or the the lack of control and I see that especially in in kids I'm speaking you know in front of people who are much more embedded in that in that dialogue than I am but I've been acutely aware that um, you know restrictions um, restrictions that are not about children, but affect children have to be messaged in a way that enables them to still feel in control because developmentally that's so important for them, uh, no matter what their age. Uh, and the conver- and the converse is true. So you know we 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 had schools closed because the system was overwhelmed. You know um, we were in in you know in some reasons the public health system was overwhelmed. The acute care system was overwhelmed. And so it was considered and it was advocated for as a last measure to really um, burn out the activity that's associated with schooling and socialization. But now when we talk about schools reopening, it's, it's like taking another lens and saying, this is gonna be just about the kids and the youth. This is not gonna be about you. It's not gonna be about returning to um, a way of life that was was pleasant for adults before. Like this is about returning um, w- returning an essential service for for children children and youth. And so when we talk about schools reopening, I think it's disingenuous to talk about our lives returning to a state of normalcy. Like this is a priority because of the harms that we've heard now and that we've been hearing in our homes and in our communities um, and in our healthcare system, the harms that we're seeing associated with the pandemic restrictions on children and youth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are ways that we can talk about how schools can reopen safely and sustainably, but one of the basic measures is to make sure that our community transmission patterns remain low Mm -hmm. because that is, you know, one of our safest and surest ways to keep um, COVID, uh, to, to break the chain of transmission in schools. Yeah, I think it's worth uh, mentioning, Nisha, just, and thanks for being so, uh, putting things in perspective, on t- you know, in terms of living day to day and not needing perfect, screw perfect. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, this would be, probably be helpful from a lot of people in terms of your, per- in, fr- in terms of your perspective, what you would like to see for uh, schools to be open safely um, 
overall? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the good, I think I have to take a step back in terms of, it's not necessarily uh, what I want to see, but it's what we had been seeing in schools that I would want to have sustained and made more robust so that it's not variable between schools or among boards. We've had great collaboration among our boards so that there has been consistent messaging um, for families across the city. So that's one pertinent positive and I'd like to continue to see that. Ensuring that our contact tracing capacity is, um, is robust and, and prioritizing school related cases, that's gonna be important for timely identification um, and isolation of, of individuals with COVID as well as uh, high risk contacts, expanding our lab capacity. So, you know, now that we have this appointment, I say now, but it's been months that we've had this appointment based, um, this appointment based service for our testing centers. You know, we've, we've got space, we, getting our kids and our staff and our families tested helps to inform our understanding of where COVID is spreading in our community and, and acting to either to break those chains as well as prevent those chains from recurring, you know, in a, in a similar context in a different space. Um, being, being more systematic with how we collect our data so that it informs our decisions around um, isolation of cohorts or individuals or classrooms, um, as well as supporting families in the community. Um, and, you know, I think we talk about supports um, in general. It's like to think about a school in isolation of its community is, is, a, is I think, false. You know, mm -hmm. schools are embedded institutions in the community. So what we do for schools is what we should be doing for our communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like whether it's screening, uh, screening for symptoms or... Um, screening for contacts, whether it's about um, getting kids to self-isolate and providing them with the supports at home while they isolate to be um, as integrated as possible in school. The same goes for parents. We can't, you know, it's, it's hard to ask for a family to self-isolate if they have food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so that involves a community investment, whether it's from the business perspective, from the city perspective, to support families that have food insecurity to self-isolate when they're symptomatic or they're exposed. We shouldn't be having families choose between the food on their table versus the public's health. That's yeah. not their decision to make. Yeah. And then I've talked about something called school self-isolation, and maybe that's not gonna be popular. However, given that we talk about schools being the last to close and the first to open, we should stick by that. So when schools reopen, again, this is just for the kids and youth, this is not for adults. And so we maintain the restrictions that we have while schools reopen and we continue our restrictions. So no expanded gatherings or extracurricular activities for a point in time so that we can be on top of the uh, case identification and the isolation and the contact tracing and just make sure that our measures are well in place. And then we can start to have multi-sectoral conversations about what we can peel away in terms of the restrictions. Do you know what, uh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. sorry. I don't no, no, my, like my last point in all of this is communication. So we're doing some of that tonight, but you know, ensuring that, that the public is aware of what it means for school self-isolation, what it means for screening and single symptoms and uh, the importance of testing, what it does for the individual, what it does for their family and loved ones and what it does for their community. And, you know, no shame, blame language yes. with tracing and isolation hotels. You know, so these are, again, not just like these, yeah, these are, these are, broad strategies and that's why like the more people who are engaged in this not just pediatric infectious disease physicians who are you know um clamoring for schools to reopen safely the more engaged our community is the more willing they will be to take the extraordinary actions that we're asking them to take 
you should I got to tell you that's you just nailing it. I'm sorry, but it's just, it's like one thing I'll say that I love is the resource angle, like with this, like a staggered opening, like schools being first to last to close, first to open. Think about the fact that you have that much more resources. Public health has that much more resources to invest in the tracing and uh, screening because we're not opening everything. It's really right. focused on the school. I think that's brilliant. Communication. Um, Julia, if you could put a link to Heidi's episode, everyone needs to listen to this episode with Heidi Tvorek talking about communication strategies when it comes to COVID single person, like the, like she gives BC a, as an example, single person, clear messaging, positive reinforcement, no shaming, talking to, uh, talking to people in their language. They were talking like in Senegal, how, um, as an example, they would hire like graffiti artists to say, this is how you put on your mask. Uh, you know, showing how the cool ways to put on masks or even um, hip hop artists, you know, to be able to communicate uh, about the risk of COVID to, to the youth as opposed to, no offense, Doug Ford, but like in that army of people and you don't know who's going to speak next. You know what I'm saying? Like all these things that make so much sense. And then the one other thing I got to uh, plug to is in terms of um, self-isolation, one of the beautiful things that uh, the state of Vermont has done, which has done very well when it comes to the uh, battle on COVID is they literally give like at these testing stations, if they're worried about someone, they have a voucher where you could go and stay at that hotel. You don't have to go and put some online or something, or you got to like extra red tape steps to be able to do it. But like, are you, you're not sure you could self isolate Here's this voucher. You could stay at this hotel. We have taken care of it. Sleep easy. You know what I'm saying? Like innovation, thinking outside the box. I mean, I don't want to digress too much with people, but like, yes, everything that Nisha said, beautiful. Okay. Before taking any questions, um, I just want to reach out to the panel um, and say just a general question. Like we don't know when we're going back, right? Like uh, in terms of uh, going uh, back to, uh, to in-person in class schools, is there any, so I don't know how to ask this question to say, um, like what can, what, are there anything else we could do to cope in general? Uh, like if this is, you know, if we're going to March, if we're going to, uh, who knows, is there, is there advice you could give or, or things that come to mind to say, you know, um, how we could get through this? Cause I'm, I, I'm really worried about my, our kids and, um, we're doing this to, to really, um, hopefully push the envelope to, to get things moving, but any things that come to mind, um, and I saw Ariel, you unmuted. I don't know if you, you had something you wanted to throw down. Yeah, <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, specifically for families to know that teachers and schools really are there for them um, to please reach out. I think not all parents are aware that they can, you know, reach out when it's uh, struggles with their kids, when it's not necessarily academic. Um, but schools really are a hub, not just for academics, you know, but as we've spoken about uh, for, for wellness for, for children in a more universal way. Um, I think a lot of parents don't know that they can advocate, um, you know, so things like being able to say, um, you know, this, that being on meets all day is really not working for my child. Um, you know, can we can we talk about this and figure out, you know, something else? Because teachers really are understanding. Um, you know, they're they're being told that they need to provide a certain number of minutes live per day. Um, so they're doing that. But I think for families just to know that schools really are there for them and to reach out. I know it's easier said than done. I, I completely agree. I think advocacy is is going to be huge right now. But again, that's an equity issue. It's it's the parents who have the time and have the ability to to step in and help make those calls. But um, you you do please 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 <laughs> talk to your teacher uh, if if the homework is too much, if the Zoom time is too much. There's there's always a way to alter it. Um, and I would say um, again. I'm hearing more from families being stressed and again, you're stuck together, but as much as possible to keep the relationship first and the academic in the background. Um, I know a lot of parents are really stressed that their kids are, are falling behind or they feel like they have to help keep their, their kid um, at a certain pace and it's getting in the way of their relationship. And I personally feel that 
that parent child relationship is way more important than the academics that we're going to cover in the next six months. So trying to keep that in mind again, easier said than done when you're around your kid all day, but. Yeah, I would agree. I could, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michelle. I was going to say, let a bunch of stuff go and just be okay with it. And I think it is really about the relationships. And, you know, I was actually at a presentation this morning that was at a specific intervention about children and parents and their relationships. And something that struck me about it is, um, you know, this is very specific to that model, but even I think it, by extrapolation, you know, five minutes a day that your child knows they have your undivided attention and they get to decide what they want to do has actually been shown to make a difference. Five minutes, right? Every day consistently. And so, you know, don't tidy up the dishes right after dinner. Don't fold that basket of laundry. But if you can let that stuff go, you know, reasonably to your, as much that you can tolerate, I guess. Um, but make that commitment that you're going, you and your child are going to do something every day and they know that it's going to happen, it's going to be predictable, and they get to decide what that's going to be. And if you can only do five minutes, only do five minutes. If you can do more, great. But I think we actually all have to let go of, you know, all the stuff that we're trying to do all the time. It's just not possible. Um, I would just add that in terms of the um mental health concerns that our children are facing, there are supports that are available in the community. Um, one of the, I would say, happy consequences that have come from COVID in my field is the move to virtual service. Um, initially, that was a complete move to virtual service. And um, I can see in the future that we now have an integrated model of virtual and in-person, which just increases that capacity for families to access mental health um, services. So just say whether a family has extended health benefits or they um, are able to access the public system, there are mental health services that are available to help with the heavy lifting um, with regards to children's struggles in the home. We can help with that. We can support parents. Um, I can link Quadro to the um, crisis lines that I understand in Ottawa have, um, I, Michelle, you'd be able to speak to this better, doubled, I understand, um, particularly in our community that um, our, our rates of youth reaching out to our um, immediate crisis services has increased. Um, so, so just to add, you know, we, there are services that are available to help in the holding of children um, and parents and families as they continue to struggle through these um, ongoing closures. I can ask a question to, um, to the panelists. Um, what about, like, is there any guidance for parents on the language that we use around the pandemic and the restrictions and schools? Like, you know, I, I, have, I have had to catch myself, like if my, my kid lashes out or gets upset at, the, at their inability to connect with their friends, you know, eyeball their friends. Um, and, you know, the, and they'll say, they'll, they'll, they'll blame it on the pandemic and this, loss of control that they're feeling um, around the pandemic. Like they'll use language that I have probably used myself in terms of feeling like, oh, this is, you know, this is not my fault, but I'm bearing the brunt of, uh, of this decision. And I just wonder if there is, um, well, I think if that's borne out in your, in your work that, and, and if you've had some advice for, for those of us who maybe should talk less about the, the negative aspects of the pandemic at home. I mean, on the one hand, I'm like, well, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity to teach the kids about civic responsibility and about infectious diseases. And, you know, like a, they're a captive audience, <laughs> but on the flip side, I, it's, it's come out and it's manifested in other ways, how they've internalized it and how guilty, how much guilt that they, they carry at the prospect of making one of their elders sick or um, one of their friends sick and just it's not a well-formed question but 
wondering if you've come across I, that. I'm happy to take a stab at it uh, because we do get asked this often. Um, so for children who already had um, an anxiety manifestation, generally speaking, we see an increase in OCD tendencies because as we've talked about, my, my assumption is because of the loss of control that they're feeling. When we feel out of control, we try to control stuff. So we're seeing a lot more of those kinds of behaviors, worries, I call them with kids, sticky thinking, right? That sticky thought about, I'm going to get somebody sick, or did I wash my hands, or do I need to wash my hands more? Um, and for lots of the kids that we're seeing, that is becoming problematic for them in their in their day-to-day -day functioning. Um, in terms of the language, it really depends on the child and um, whether they whether less is more or more is more. And that is dependent, in my opinion, on the child's temperament and what they're able to handle. Um, but a bottom, like, you know, classic rule that we can just never get wrong is to be with our children. I'm stealing that term um, from a particular uh, theoretical orientation, but to be with our children during difficult moments of dysregulation is really all that they need. They don't really need the words. Um, they just need to know that we can hold them emotionally and get them organized. Uh, I think that's the number one thing that we need to do as parents in supporting our children is to organize their feelings through this very challenging time. And if we can do that with not necessarily a lot of words, um, we'll get it right every single time because that breeds security and security breeds comfort and of course resilience. So I guess I'm saying, say nothing <laughs> and be with them and you can't go wrong. Thank you. That's brilliant, brilliant. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna throw down a couple of questions that came through in the audience. Actually, first one is a selfish question and I'm gonna to go to, to Aaron for this. Um, Ta-da. Um, <sighs> Because you mentioned, it was a really good point, the, the value of being connected to your parents, to the kids and the parents is, is probably more valuable than the curricula. Is there a point where parents should be worrying about, you know, is it going to be too late for my kids to catch up if they're really struggling around this? Because I, I think this is on the minds of a lot of parents. I mean, I, I'll even say selfishly, like we, we're, our kids are doing half days, you know what I'm saying? And we're like, I mean, I got three sons. We're we're getting them outside and keeping them active. You know, like, otherwise they're going to destroy the house. Um, <laughs> so, any perspective on um, you know catching up per se? Yeah, I I have a bit of a hard time because um, luckily in our school we don't have grade levels. Um, the kid is where they're at, so it is a, a self paced system. But when it comes to the actual curriculum you don't need a full day of school. Like the actual academic hardcore learning part is, is not the full day. So the fact that you're getting them outside, I think that that is actually going to do more good than making them sit and do an, a, another math worksheet or something like that, right? Um, if again, major equity issue, but if you have the parent who has the time and is willing to put in some of the energy, um, what I, I think they're actually getting more behind on is, is the collaboration and, and the hands-on learning that normally occurs. Um, you know, it's one thing to do math by yourself, that's fine, but it, it is those, uh, those problem-solving challenges. So if there's any way that you as a family can, you know, come up with some fun building steam type of things, and I'd be happy to send anything. But uh, that's, that's what I would worry about more. And reading, like if they're reading, You'll be fine, but yeah, and it's hard. hard. To, I could just 
jump in there. Yeah, yeah, um, I get and and you know, as Aaron's really spoken to, you know, the equity piece that um, the concerns that I have are for students with pretty significant learning needs, um, either where they're not able to be assessed right now um, because schools are not open. So those that are doing the assessments can't do that virtually. Um, so that's you know, so their needs can't be identified, and then you know, targeting the supports um, can't happen or it's postponed. So so I do worry about, um, you know, the length of time that passes for some of those students um, and, you know, how we're going to make up for that um, when we return. Fair enough. Um, okay. Um, the, oh, what was the question? Oh, yes. Um, there was a question about the, you know, I guess maybe this is for Adrian or whoever. Um, some of the mental health concerns that we've talked about with our kids, are you feeling that's a local thing? Do you feel like that's uh, like global, like a Canadian thing is like uh, any place that has their schools closed? Um, like, is this pretty much a global problem? Uh, I don't know the data on, on um, the specific increase in reported mental health symptoms. Um, but I think it would be safe to assume that we have seen an increase in uh, mental health challenges among our youth across the board. Um, I don't think that that's specifically related to um, to Ottawa and our, or Ontario and our extended school closure. I think even, I think the school closure is just sort of adding an entire different layer of struggles in all the ways that we've described. But COVID in general, um, since it has run through, has had a significant impact on children's mental health. And my sense is because of, as I said earlier, that deprivation of social connection that is a developmental need that children have and youth have at all different stages of development um, that has been taken from them. And so naturally there are significant struggles that come along with that. Fair enough. And I, I, I mean, this is not a scientific article, but I did, I did see an article earlier about uh, the state of Nevada that they uh, open schools because of the increasing rates of uh, child uh, suicide. Um, so just, I know that's, I didn't read and see the data myself, but it, that was an mm -hmm. article in, uh, that came out uh, recently. So um, mm -hmm. if that puts any context to it. Um, Can I make a quick comment about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this is not a good reason to go to school, but it sort of is right now for just to have, to have somewhere to go. And kids actually have nowhere to go. I can walk out of my house and go to the grocery store just because, right? I'm like, I'm going to get milk again because I need to go somewhere, <laughs> right? Kids have nowhere to go. They have been closing toboggan hills. They're not allowed to go to their friends. Um, so I, these are actually not small things. If you think about, you know, I walk into the hospital and I think, oh, I can see somebody. It's like this little piece of joy in my day. And we're not offering that to kids anywhere. So, you know, they seem like small things, but I don't think they're small at all. And even access to outdoor spaces, right? That, you know, that some of us have backyards and my kids can go out and play in a fenced in yard. But if you're living in an apartment building and the local ski um, Toboggan Hill has closed, then yeah, you're not, you know, you're, you don't have any other place to be able to get uh, with nature to get the fresh air. Oh, man. No, it's a, uh, it's a very good point. I, and I, I, it's one of the things that I took for granted, um, you know, with, with my wife, for example, like, throughout this pandemic, I've been going to work and talking to people. You know what I'm saying? Like, actually, in some, in a lot of ways, in the heights of the pandemic, going in, in, in into a COVID state, I'm like, I'm glad I'm going to work, you know, and that just goes to show how much connection and, and having like a clear purpose, uh, how beneficial that could be for your well being. Um, all right, couple other questions. 
Um, Roger, I did think sorry, I could ahead. answer one of the questions. Sorry, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry to interrupt Keep... you, but I noticed because because there was one specifically about reaching out to schools um, oh, yes. and feeling like you know there's nothing that can be done or receiving that um, that kind of response. And I would say, you know, I think you know all, again, all of us are really stressed. I think there's just so much on all of our plates. Um, I think you know if you've reached out by a phone call, try an email, um, you know, try different ways of communicating, um, and if you know if teachers are feeling like it's outside of their power to be able to do anything um, being able to speak with the school administrators is a great option um, my role as a school social worker is as an advocate so you know that is their social workers assigned to each school um, so i would just encourage you to uh, you know to try again and, and speak with other people that are, are within your school thanks for that ariel um the sorry nisha you look like you were going no, to no, it's because i was i'm i'm looking at the question now oh, okay yeah COVID risk of in-person school yeah i was going to read that one next yeah so yeah. michelle yeah. who's no. a, a dear friend what's up michelle hope you're doing well she said can you speak to the actual COVID risk of in-person schooling what is the, mm -hmm. the disease risk trade-off we're talking about when with opening up schools for in-person again especially as comparison to the risk from all other threats you've been speaking about tonight. That um, last part of the question is really the hardest part because we are counting COVID cases really well and we are it's going to take us a while to count the harms to be able to articulate the harms and then to to count them if ever. And so that is a harder question to answer, but knowing what we know about um, in-person schooling. So uh, the data out of Ontario, and I'll start and I'll mention that with a caveat that it's not perfect data because we have not been able to get every individual who was exposed to um, a case of COVID to get tested as a high-risk contact to see the, the degree of the spread. But what, what we the, from the data that we do have, and it's seen in other jurisdictions too, with, with good compliance to infection control measures like distancing, masking, and smaller cohorts, um, we, we've seen very little transmission. So very few individuals who pick up COVID in the classroom setting. Um, it's not to, and that, but, but then you'll also hear about um, some schools where there were multiple cases um, related to the circumstances in that setting. So I, it, it, it's not an easy question to answer. However, um, thus far, our measures have worked. For me, the key is that, I mean, we, we know that if we're gonna reopen um, schools, while our numbers are high, and I'm saying that our numbers are going down, so that's reassuring, that we still have a risk of having introductions of COVID into the school. What that means is individuals with unrecognized COVID-19, uh, so that students or staff coming into the school. We've got, we've got really good measures to prevent transmission in the school setting, but it's about having multiple introductions, putting stress on those infection control measures. So that's why for me, I keep talking about the, um, the, like the, the ongoing restrictions in the context of reopening so that we have fewer kids who have household exposures to COVID, um, fewer kids who have exposures to each other with unrecognized COVID. Um, and so, and, and, and that, then means having a strong testing and tracing system, which I can at least say in Ottawa that, that we're in a good position. I can't speak for other public health units, but I know that um, our public health unit uh, since the start of the school year has prioritized uh, um, investigating school related cases and prioritizing reaching out and identifying other students and staff who are high risk contacts and asking them to get tested. So, you know, we have all the right measures in place. 
the individual action that's important there is getting tested, right? And that, that's where we need the community buy-in to get tested and to self-isolate, even if that test is negative. So, you know, my at the end of the day, I think that the, that the actual risk of transmission in school is low when we have our infection control measures in place, but we have to be able to monitor um, not just compliance, uh, we have to support schools to keep those measures up. And we also have to monitor for cases of, of COVID so that if there are gaps in our infection control practices, whether or public or public health measures in school or outside of school, then you know, we're able to have, public health is able to respond to that quickly and prevent ongoing spread in our community. There's an excellent document that actually summarizes all of this, and I'm going to mention it because Nisha's not going to toot her horn because she contributed to it. Um, the hospital sick kids uh, and other children's hospitals and others put out a document, and if you want to look at it, I'm just looking at the name, it's Guidance to School Operation During the Pandemic. It is evidence-based, it summarizes it all in plain language. And um, as Nisha has been articulating, there's a very strong recommendation that schools can open safely, even in this context, and should because of the balance of risks, um, uh, possible risk with reopening versus the risks that we see happening. So um, it's in plain language. I would suggest you go and read it. And um, thank you, Nisha, for being part of that. The teens who aren't taking the pandemic seriously, who struggle in running loose through the cutting on classes. You something, cut out something, again. Something's wrong with my audio. I, I could take a stab at it. I was, I, it's a hard question. Uh, I saw it there and I was, I, I had a chance to, to think about it. Um, and that's absolutely something that parents are very concerned about is teens who are out and about with their friends and um, are feeling invincible to this illness, um, this virus and being seriously impacted by it. Um, and I don't have any groundbreaking answer to that because they are fulfilling, you know, they, in adolescence, that is, they are built to explore and challenge and feel invincible. Um, that is the classic definition of an adolescent. Um, so the COVID pandemic, I don't think would be an exception in their eyes to that developmental stage. Um, I think maybe at more of a macro level, um, going to Nisha's point around communication, um, I think that the way that it's been communicated to the public, I know the teens say it to me, teens that I would have assumed, like I checked in on early on because I was so concerned of their anxiety um, when, when COVID, um, you know, took over our, our lives. Um, their, the communication that they feel that, that they understand about this um, virus is that they're fine. They won't be impacted. They don't get it. They don't spread it. They don't get sick. Um, so I think probably at more of a macro level, the communication might need to be a bit different um, to our youth. And then also an understanding that that's very developmentally typical that teens would be pushing those boundaries because that's what they do. I, and your sister said that that's the way you were when you were a kid, by the way. My sister did not say that. Yeah, she she actually said Yeah, she did, by the way. Well, my you sister did that. I didn't do that. My sister actually, did both that. Both of you guys were trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to add on, if I could, just um, in addition to that, and actually it was um, a presentation I watched given by Dr. Chang at CHEO, um, and there was somebody from PLEO, the Parents Lifeline of Eastern Ontario, on the panel at the end of that um, presentation and answering some questions, and a similar question came up, and she was recommending for parents where you know that your teens are not following recommendations, that they are out and socializing, is to have your own protocol at home when the kids, when the teens come home, that they change their clothes, that they're washing their hands, you know, you set it up in a way that you can, you know, control within your own home environment, uh, hopefully reducing the likelihood of spread. I thought that was really interesting. I like that innovation. All right, guys, I'm gonna well, take, 
Sorry, go ahead. Someone was. No, I was just going to say that the approach we always take with teens is harm reduction, right? Um, putting those black and white rules in place, we know doesn't work. It makes them want to do the opposite. So I think parents also have to have in that in mind. And so that might mean that you are doing things slightly different for your teen than you're doing for your 10 year old or your five year old. Um, and I'm not saying that you, you know, waive the rules, but I think you, it's better to have that open communication about what are you doing? How do we reduce the risks as opposed to you can't do it and then, then proceeding with it? I mean, I don't want to digress too much, but I think this is one of the messages I think that was lost with COVID is the harm reduction element. You know, you're not, not everything could be so black and white um, and, um and that adds to also to the shaming piece that we were talking about. Like you really, we want to, we need to have realistic expectations, um, you know. Um, but anyway, that was my blurb. We got one last question and I, I actually love this question and I'm not sure who the best person to answer this is, but we'll, I'll throw down and you guys decide. I think this panel has been great. Damn straight, it's been great. Um, but what actions can you as professionals that are experiencing this take to really sound the alarm on this to the government and prioritize and accelerate reopening of schools? Does anyone want to grab this one? <laughs> it's a tough one. I'll, I've I'll been on. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. No. No, I, I mean, I love the question because yes, put it on us. I don't think we've been doing enough. I honestly don't think we've been doing enough. And I I gotta say, we've been, I've been, I'm really glad, Adrian, you, you uh, brought this up to me because I'm doing, personally, I'm doing what I know how to do. Increase awareness. We had, um, I'm not saying who, but a media person joining in on listening in. I mean, I'll tell you this. When we decided to do this, I texted every media connection I knew. I emailed every uh, um, media connection we knew. I've done personally done, I think, two or three um, uh, media interviews talking about this. We need to step up. We, there's no, enough of this like s sitting at the wayside and being, hey, someone else is going to deal with this. We have a platform. People, I'm thinking specifically us docs, man. Like we, people look up to our profession, to what we do, and it's not good enough to just say, hey, you know, someone else is going to deal with it. I'm going to do it my, my day to day. We need to advocate. We need to be that voice for the people that can't speak for themselves. So yes, whoever asked that question, it's a good, it's a great point. Speak up, do your part. Uh, it's okay to be exposed and, and, and um, put your opinion out there. Um, but we, we need to do, we need to be doing more. Like this is for our kids. This is for our youth. You know what I'm saying? And it's hard to defend, hey, I'm just doing what I think is best for my kids. It's hard to be like uh, people to object to that. You know what I'm saying? So I, 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 I welcome the challenge and I challenge all of us on this panel out there listening now, do your part, represent, because what we're doing is not enough. Because what's happening right now, we're the only province right now that have no kids not in school right now, son. Like this is... Let's think about this. Let's not wait for it to be a problem. Like it already is a problem, but let's not wait for it to be a magnified problem. Because this, in my opinion, is generational shit. This is generational. When you impact your, that kid's mental well-being, their confidence, you know, you got that kid that was this close to, you know, maybe I was going to go apply to that engineering school and now I'm not going to. Now he's not do, do, going as far as he, he wants to be. Now it affects, you know, his uh, future relationships and, and so forth. This is what we're doing. And we're talking about, it's not one or two kids. It's landscape of kids. This can't go on forever. I'm sorry. That was, that was my, I, like I totally went off on a mad rant there, but it's just I, like, I don't know, man. Like I, me and my wife, we did an episode. I saw Julia put, put that down. And my, my wife is shy. I, I don't know if you're, some of you know, Kathy, uh, Agent Ariel, like she doesn't like any media platform or whatever but she's like i'm i'm gonna let's do this screw this let's do this talking about uh school closures and what is the impact it's having on mental health anyways I, i'm not gonna say anymore um 
<laughs> maybe I talked too much. I don't know if anybody else had anything to add to that. Um, but, well, if I can, if I can ask, uh, add something, yeah. the advocacy um, extends beyond uh, the pandemic restrictions, really, because we're talking about how to help kids cope and not strive for perfect as adults or not. Um, but what we're looking at with these extended closures is if and with the um, restrictions that we, with the closures that we had last year and the rolling strikes, so we're looking at kids who can be up to two academic years behind, uh, depending on their access to technology and educational supports. Um, and so really what we should be advocating for, it's a, it's a very, it's a, like to me, the school closures is one discrete period of time, but it's the years that we will need um, of resiliency and trust rebuilding into the education system uh, that will actually, I think, um, help our kids thrive and, and mitigate some of those losses that we've, that, that they've already experienced. So, you know, for example, this year we've had educational assistance um, and additional classroom supports that have had to be moved out because of the need for an online platform in addition to the in-person learning platform. And, and that means that those kids who were in the, who chose to be in person may not have had the additional supports that they would need to thrive. And so, you know, this has been the year that somehow uh, as a society, and I'm not saying that I agree with that at all, but we have taken a, um, uh, like a, we, 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 have, we have not prioritized education uh, alongside health. But what that means is that when the health of our population is secure, we absolutely have no, like, we have no excuse for um, reinvesting in education, because it's going to, it's going to actually take more investment than what education has received now to recover from the losses that these uh, individuals have sustained over the last two years, because we're talking two years of disrupted education. Mm -hmm. And, there, and this is not unprecedented. So anyone who says this is an unprecedented disruption in education has not seen um, other epidemics, pandemics, and other disrupted environments where education loss has been associated with um, long-term uh, consequences to that generation in the absence of mitigation measures. So to me, the, like I'm, I'm, burning for kids to get back for the here and now. Uh, and, and Adrian and others have spoken to the harms of the here and now, but I'm also trying to think ahead. You know, we never, we never, none of us ever really thought schools were safe before. We knew that the kids were gonna come home with a runny nose. The fact that we have no RSV or influenza in our hospital speaks to the effectiveness of hand washing and distancing and masking in our communities and in our schools. But this is not gonna be the way it's, uh, that the way that we want to see education in the future. So between education loss recovery and um, keeping schools safe, I think we actually have a lot of work that we all need to roll up our sleeves and do collectively to, pro to reprioritize children's education as, as, a, as an investment to their health in the long run. Amen. Amen. Listen, thank you. Thank you all for doing your part. Thank you for joining us in talking about our concerns, uh, being an advocate for not only your children, but uh, all the other kids out there in, in uh, Ottawa, Ontario. I, I think this hopefully adds to that, the, the story of like why, you know, what are the dangers of, of having our, our, our schools closed? And um, I just really appreciate the, the level of expertise, the knowledge that was thrown down. I hope it was insightful. Um, those that are that maybe came in late will definitely be able to, um, we'll be uh, putting this out on a podcast format so that you'll be able to listen to it, circulate it, send it out to whomever. Because uh, like I said, this is too important of an issue. So. Michelle, Ariel, Nisha, Aaron, Adrian, Julia too, screening the, the, the questions. Thank you so much. 
And this was amazing. Thanks so much for doing this, you guys.